Hello and welcome to the Maternal Hemorrhage Challenge Lecture for Emergency Medicine and Acute Care course. My name's Ken Milne. Maternal hemorrhages can be stress-provoking presentation. Who here goes, yay, a pregnant patient has arrived and is bleeding? But this is one of those true medical emergencies. So the first rule of emergency medicine kicks in. Don't panic. All bleeding stops. Eventually. So just deal with the problem. And this lecture will help you identify, investigate, and treat patients with maternal hemorrhages. So I'm going to divide this up into maternal hemorrhages, which include ectopic pregnancies, placental abruptions, and trauma, and then postpartum hemorrhage. So let's start with early pregnancy and bleeding from an ectopic pregnancy standpoint. What is the best way to make the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy? It certainly is an important diagnosis to make because it's the leading cause of first trimester maternal deaths. Less than half of patients who present with the classic abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. Less than half. And 50% of those patients have no risk factors. So they haven't had previous ectopics. They're not getting in vitro fertilization. They haven't had STDs. There's no IUD in place and they haven't had a previous tubal. So what is the best way to diagnose an ectopic pregnancy? Is it the history? The physical? The lab tests? Well, JAMA does a great series called the Rational Clinical Exam, and JAMA did one on how to diagnose ectopic pregnancy, and it included about 12,000 women from 14 prospective trials, and they looked at the likelihood ratios. Now, none of them had positive likelihood ratios high enough for us to feel confident that the person had an ectopic pregnancy. The likelihood ratios ranged between 2 and 5, and we like to see a likelihood ratio of greater than 10. Now for ruling out the negative likelihood ratios, again, they weren't great for ruling things out. They were between 0.5 and 0.9. We'd like to see less than 0.1. But transvaginal ultrasounds actually did have really good positive and negative likelihood ratio. The positive likelihood ratio for transvaginal ultrasound was 111. So significantly more than 10, an order of magnitude in fact. The negative likelihood ratio was pretty good. It was 0.12, so that's pretty good. And so transvaginal ultrasound seems to be the way to go to rule in and rule out ectopic pregnancies. But what are the diagnostic challenges associated with an abruption? Now, ultrasound is the way to go with ectopic. We just talked about that. But what about a placental abruption? Ultrasound is not very sensitive for detecting an abruption. Glance et al. in 2002 looked at 149 consecutive patients at greater than 24 weeks gestation getting an ultrasound to rule out abruption. The sensitivity was lousy, 24%, but the specificity was better at 96%, with a positive predictive value of 88% and a negative predictive value rate of 53%. So you missed a lot with ultrasound. But if you did see an ultrasound, sorry, if you did see an abruption on ultrasound, those babies got more aggressive treatment and ultimately did worse. So how about a CT scan? Why not just get a CT scan and look for these abruptions? Well, we et al. in 2009 looked at CTs to find abruptions in 44 trauma patients. There were some methodological problems with this study. Basically, it was an unblinded gold standard. And you can see in the results how this affected things. The original CT interpretation had a sensitivity of only 43%, but the specificity was better at 90%. But the sensitivity went up when the unblinded, the untrained and trained reviewers. So if they knew what they were looking for, they were more likely to find it. Well, how about avoiding that radiation? Because we really don't want to be irradiating pregnant women. How about avoiding that radiation, putting in women in a large magnet, like an MRI? Will that do better than a CT scan and an ultrasound? Yes, but access to an MRI can be difficult in many practice situations. Mazzelli et al. in 2011 looked at 145 women with pelvic pain who had an ultrasound. 40 had indeterminate ultrasounds, so got an MRI. 50% of those women had abnormalities, 25% needed surgery, and they found five appendixes that needed to be removed and three placental abruptions. So MRI is helpful, it avoids radiation, but you may have limited access. So let's do a brief review here. 
on the diagnosis of painful bleeding in a particular placental abruption. Ultrasound was not very helpful, CT is not much better, and you get radiation with that. The MRI is good, but you may have limited access. How about just doing a simple blood test to check for a placental abruption? It looks like these are not very reliable either. The next two abstracts go through that, and they both say, or sorry, they both look at the same thing but come to opposite conclusions. So Munch, that's M-U-E-C, M-U-E-N-C-H et al. in 2004, looked at 71 blunt trauma patients and looked at the Kleihauer betke test or KB test for predicting uterine contractions and preterm labor. And it seemed to do okay, and they suggested that it should be routinely performed on all trauma patients. But Danje, that's D-H-A-N-R-A-J et al. in 2004, took 105 patients and said, whoa, no, let's not do that routinely. Because when they looked at 105 patients, they looked at trauma patients and compared it to patients without trauma. And the KB test was positive in 2.6% of the trauma patients. Okay, 2.6% of the trauma patients had a positive KB, and they were going to use that to predict badness. But when they compared that to women undergoing routine testing, 5.1% or double had a positive KB test. And none of the women in the trauma group with the positive KB test showed clinical abruption or fetal distress. Clearly a more patient-oriented outcome than the surrogate rise in the KB marker. So they thought that routine testing is not indicated and it was costly. How about some guidelines? I mean, if things are confusing, maybe we get some guidelines to help us out. Well, ASAP does have some guidelines and they'll be in the actual printed documents that you can go to to look at managing trauma in obstetrical patients. There are also some guidelines from some non-emergency department or non-emergency medicine uh, societies such as the American College of Surgeons and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. But we don't tend to follow them. CELE et al. looked at 236 pregnant trauma patients and we did a poor job according to the ACOG guidelines. In particular, maternal vitals were often missing. Few patients were seen by obstetricians, only 16%, but remember these are guidelines written up by the obstetricians. And 100% were admitted, and they felt based on the guidelines that only 7% really needed to be admitted. So big deal, we don't follow the guidelines. But how good are the guidelines are in the first place? Do they change outcome? So let's take a look at that issue. Do we really need to do the, the big workup in these minor trauma patients? And the answer seems to be no. Cahill et al. in 2008 looked at 317 women greater than 24 weeks with minor trauma. They all got physical exams, ultrasounds, four hours of monitoring, admitted for 24 hours if they were having contractions. And so 14% ended, ended up getting admitted for more than 24 hours. They had a composite outcome of abruption, delivery at less than 37 weeks, and a birth weight less than the 20th percentile, or sorry, less than the 10th percentile. And 10% had that composite outcome. And the predictors of adverse outcomes had sensitivities between 2% and 42%. So I think we can all agree that these are terrible sensitivities. So their conclusion was that an extensive workup for minor trauma in a pregnant woman was probably not warranted. All right, so let's make this a little harder. What about if the person who's hemorrhaging, who's pregnant, is also RH negative? Well, we often don't check the RH status, and giving RIG in the setting of trauma makes sense. So let's look at a few studies. There was a move away from giving routine RIG or um, RA to RH negative women in first trimester miscarriages. Giffy et al. in 2012 looked at 808 patients presenting to a single ED with a sensitizing event. And the bottom line is they did not seem to do very well in both testing and treating these patients. 560 they thought sustained a sensitizing event. So 560 women they thought sustained a, um, a sensitizing event. How many got tested? About three quarters. And they found 8% were RH negative. And how many got RIG? Well, 56%, so just over half. And then they had about 200 and 
50 patients that they thought had potentially sensitizing events. Just over a third of those got tested. When they did test, 6% tested positive or showed up as RH negative, so were RH negative patients, and zero, yes, zero percent were treated with RIG. So how much RIG do you give? Well, Thorpe et al. and Kim et al. discuss that in the next two abstracts. A volume of just 0.1 ml of fetal blood can trigger an immune response, and this needs to be given within 72 hours, or else the horse is out of the barn. The typical dose is 300 micrograms for fetal blood of up to 30 mils. A larger dose is needed if more major trauma has occurred, and these two articles suggest that 99% of the time a standard dose will be enough. Now I just threw in this next abstract about early maternal hemorrhage to provoke a response about some dogma. This one is for David Newman. You know David Newman from the NNT.com and also the podcast Smart EM. And what I did was I pulled out in the database to try to answer the question, do RH negative women with first trimester even need RIG? Well, the evidence is very weak. There is only one randomized control trial of 57 patients from 1972. They have a single case control trial of 48 patients, a single case report, Now, they do have 12 reviews of articles and expert opinions and seven studies on fetal maternal hemorrhage transfusion. But in the randomized control trial, the highest level of evidence, none of the women with a first trimester um, abortion became sensitized. So unless you are uncertain of the dates or it's in a setting of trauma, there is no good scientific evidence to routinely give RIG. But I'm going to make a caution here. Just because we don't have good evidence does not mean you should stop doing it. And I'm not advocating not doing it. But it does challenge some of the long-held dogma that we have. And that article that I was talking about was by Hanafin, H-A-N-N-A-F-I-N, from the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, 2006. Hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of direct maternal death worldwide and the fifth leading cause of maternal death in the developed world. ACOG, which I mentioned earlier, has a number of documents addressing the issue of postpartum hemorrhage. And you can go to www.acog.org and search for the various resources. A number of abstracts in the EM database address the the issue of postpartum hemorrhage. The first question is, can we prevent these life-threatening bleeds? Various medical therapies are available for postpartum hemorrhage, and the number one is oxytocin, both IV or IM. It's the most frequently recommended medical therapy, but misoprostol has recently been used. Bellad, B-E-L-L-A-D, et al., in 2002, sorry, 2012, looked at over 650 women from India in a double-blinded study using low-dose sublingual mis- misoprostol at a dose of 400 milligrams, And the doses are important because of the second abstract. So 400 milligrams compared to a standard dose of 10 international units of oxytocin. And they found less blood loss with sublingual misoprostol. How much less? 170 mils. Now, bleeding of greater than 500 mils was seen in 3% of patients in the misoprostol group and 9% in the oxytocin group. There was no difference in blood pressure and more side effects with the misoprostol group, in particular nausea and vomiting, shivering, and pyrexia. Now let's move on to the next abstract, because FIGO recommends 800 milligrams uh, in the next abstract of sublingual misoprostol, so that's twice the dose of before, and 400 international units IV of oxytocin, so that's four times the dose that was used in the India study. And they say only give misoprostol if oxytocin is not available. Don't repeat the dose of misoprostol and don't add it to oxytocin. And they do say there are lots of side effects to misoprostol. So oxytocin is the first line and uh, is first and misoprostol if oxytocin is not available. What about TXA? We're using TXA and we've seen that it works in the CRASH-2 trial for trauma and there is a study that shows that it works topically for epistaxis. Ducolo and Boothers in 2011 used TXA in an open-label study of over 150 French women with blood loss of greater than 800 mils after a vaginal birth. 
People were randomized to get TXA, a 4 gram loading dose, followed by 1 gram per hour infusion, or nothing. The primary outcome was total blood loss at 6 hours. The difference was 51 mils. Are you impressed? Now, there were a number of other secondary outcomes favoring TXA, but again, um, I was not impressed with that 51 mils as their primary outcome, even though it was statistically different. All right, so if uterotonics, such as medications, are not successful, you can consider a tamponade device to treat postpartum hemorrhage. Rathorn et al. did a small study of 18 women with postpartum hemorrhage. So 18 women, that is small. They used a condom tip balloon catheter and it worked in 17 of them. The median time to stopping bleeding was six minutes. That's pretty good. Avad, that's A-Y-A-D-I et al., did a meta-analysis of five studies looking at non-pneumatic anti-shock garments. Now these are a low-tech device where you wrap the woman's abdomen and pelvis with Velcro straps and it reduced blood loss by 50%. There was a 38% relative reduction in mortality, and it's perhaps something that could be used in a rural setting if there was long transport times. Now, a more high-tech device is a vaginal interuterine balloon system called EBB, and it was discussed by Dildi et al. in 2014, and they looked at 51 women with postpartum hemorrhages at 11 different sites, and they placed a balloon after medical management, and the time to placement was just over two hours. So they placed this EBB device over two hours after the person had had medical management. And then they left it in for 20 hours. It worked in all but one cases, in all but one case. But I should caution you that multiple authors have financial ties to the company here. So that could introduce some significant bias. And finally, the last abstract, I want to summarize all the postpartum hemorrhage information, and that's in the World Health Organization Published Guidelines 2013 in the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics. All right, so key points and recommendations from this lecture. Number one, ultrasound is the best way when trying to diagnose ectopic pregnancy. Number two, placental abruption is more difficult to diagnose with ultrasound, CT is not very good, while well, MRI is better, but may not be available. The Kleinhauer betke test, that blood test we were talking about, may, and of course if I say may, Jerry Hoffman would say may not, predict preterm labor and maternal trauma patients, and I presented two conflicting abstracts on that. Number four, guidelines do exist from ASAP, ACS, and ACOG for pregnant patients, pregnant, pregnant trauma patients, but we often don't follow them. However, in minor trauma, cases uh, evaluation seems unwarranted to do the big workup. The fifth point is evidence for giving RIG in the first trimester bleeds and miscarriages is weak. That means that's not, I'm not saying not to do it. I'm saying just know that the evidence is weak. Six, that RH testing in pregnant trauma patients is often not done. And while the risk of fetal maternal hemorrhage is unknown, RIG should be routinely given to RH negative pregnant trauma patients. Seven, oxytocin is that first line agent to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, while misoprostol and TXA have also been shown to work, but they're not your first line agent. Number eight, uterine tamponade devices are available and can be used when PPH or postpartum hemorrhage does not respond to medical therapy. And finally, there's that World Health Organization publication on the guidelines summarizing the management of postpartum hemorrhage. Well, thank you very much, I'm Ken Milne. And that's it for the maternal hemorrhage challenges.